Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Introducing a Brighter Way 401k Group Plan Solution. I am Kayla Nelson, and will be moderating today's presentation. Before we get started, there are a few housekeeping items to cover. If you have any questions during today's presentation, you may enter them into the chat box on your screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of today's presentation. However, to be respectful of your time, we know that we will not be able to get to them all. Therefore, following today's webinar, we will review all questions and send out the answers via email as soon as we can. You will find a copy of today's presentation in the handout section. We will also be sending a copy of the presentation along with a recording of today's webinar in the next day or two. Today's webinar will be given by Paul McEwen, Principal at Rand Associates with Mike Conant, Regional Vice President, Transamerica, and they will introduce you to a Brighter Way 401k Group Plan Solution. Welcome, Paul and Mike. Thanks, Kaylin, and thanks everyone for joining today. Um, to learn about our pooled plan solution that we call the Brighter Way 401k Group Plan Solution. I also want to thank Mike for participating in the webinar today. It takes all of us working together to bring world-class 401k plans to the small plan market. And we all rely on each other to make sure that plan sponsors and participants have an awesome experience with their workplace retirement plan and that plan participants consistently move forward along their uh, journey to retirement readiness. We're going to get through the slides as quickly as possible today uh, to leave as much time as possible for questions and discussion at the end. We presented this same material about 15 months ago. That was a deeper dive into the details of the platform and especially the investment selection and monitoring process. Uh, today we just want to remind you all about our pooled plan solution and to help you better understand where it might fit well within your plan advisory practice and uh, and with certain uh, plan sponsor clients. Pool arrangements are only one solution um, in mutual plan, you know, in our mutual plans solutions toolbox, so uh, all of us. It's not always the best fit for a plan sponsor, but oftentimes it is a solution worth considering. Uh, so I just want to say that up front. So we're not trying to sell you, you know, this isn't a solution for, for every um, scenario. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, I, I fully expect single employer plans to, to continue to kind of be the majority of plans in the marketplace for the foreseeable future. But um, pooled plan solutions are making a, uh, their presence felt um, uh, more and more every year. Um, I think the other up uh, the other opportunity that you have as a as a plan advisor is with, with pool plans is the opportunity to outsource some of what you're doing today and to, to try to help you scale your practice uh, and be more efficient uh, and maybe spend more time with participants and with plan sponsors rather than uh, spending you know, as much time on the plan selection or the fund selection and monitoring process. Um, and I thought it would be helpful before we uh, jump into the slides to give you a little bit about why did we create this pooled plan solution? Why did Ray and Associates um, you know, reach out to Transamerica and, and kind of create this solution? Um, the first one was, um, it had always been a goal of mine to be able to provide all of the best governance practices that we utilize on our own plan with clients and with the, with the advisors, uh, utilizing the advisors that we work with on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, as I got to know more about these pooled plan solutions, it became apparent to me that that might be a way that we can really help plan sponsors achieve uh, some, some excellence in terms of their fiduciary governance process. Second reason or the second why for why we put this pooled, pooled plan solution together is to provide a plan solution that our investment advisor partners can easily utilize with your clients. Um, 
especially those clients that reach out to you and are interested in um, exploring a pooled plan arrangement. And then uh, I mentioned it before, but the last reason was really just to be proactive in helping our advisor partners um, scale their retirement plan advisory practice. You know, how do you focus more time on driving participant retirement readiness and less time managing the fund lineup? So those, that's really the, the reason for why we came out with this group plan solution, why we felt it was important to bring it to market. And the rest, you know, the slides, well, the rest of the information today is going to be more about the how do we do it, uh, but I felt it was important to give you the why uh, so that you'd have some, some context. And maybe some of this stuff will stick a little bit better than just just knowing the, the how. Um, Kayla, can you advance to the next slide, please? I think we already did the introduction, so we can skip through there. And I think I already kind of covered, that's kind of the agenda for the day. Um, we'll talk about who we are. We'll spend, I think you, you, you probably know who Ray and Associates is if, if you're on the call today, and you probably know who Transamerica is. So we'll go through that pretty quickly. And then we'll talk about understanding pooled plan arrangements and what the environment's like out there right now, what, what other solutions are out there in the pooled plan space, uh, the benefits of a brighter way group plan solution specifically. Um, Mike's gonna say a few words about prospecting and, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, maybe next steps if, if you're wanting to uh, consider these solutions in more depth. Next slide, please. So Ray and Associates is a, is a regional CPA firm. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. You've prob you probably know who we are. We have a dedicated uh, team within Ray and Associates that does third-party administration services. Our team is about 12 folks. And um, we have about, we serve about 800 plans a year from a plan administration perspective. That's all I'm gonna say about Ray and Associates. Mike, do you wanna say a few words about Transamerica? Sure. <clears throat> uh, yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, and we're excited to, to talk to you about uh, this group plan solution here uh, in conjunction with Paul and, and his team at Ray and Associates. If you could flip to the next slide, um, that would be helpful. And, you know, for those of you who haven't heard of Transamerica before, we're obviously a, a top 10 provider of retirement plans across the country in all markets. Uh, from startup plans all the way up to billion dollar plans. But probably the more important slide in the context of this conversation today is the next one, if we could flip to that. And that speaks a little bit to, I think, what Ray and Associates found in their due diligence process when going through an evaluation of all of the record keepers that serve the pooled plan space. We have a unique background within this uh, universe of, of plans that uh, are nuanced for sure. And we're gonna talk here in, in just a second about all the various kinds of pooled plan solutions that are out there. Uh, a lot of acronyms, uh, but multiple employer plans, pooled employer plans, group plan solutions, et cetera. We've been doing them in some way, shape or form for over 20 years. It represents over 50% of all of our new business in terms of new sales and uh, over 13,000 participating companies participate in the group plan arrangements that we have uh, out there. So we are excited to be able to um, leverage our expertise in the promotion of this solution to, um, to the advisor community out there that who might be interested in, in bringing this to clients. So next slide. All right. I think it's back to me at this point. Thanks, Mike. I appreciate um, the introductory comments on Transamerica. Transamerica really <clears throat> has distinguished itself in the pooled plan marketplace. There's a lot of challenges when you think about bringing a pooled plan arrangement to market from a record keeping perspective. And Transamerica <clears throat> has invested way more resources in their solution than many other well, I would say all other record keepers out there, it became pretty apparent when we were doing the due diligence process, they were asking questions that, that nobody else was asking when we were going through the due diligence process and they've been an awesome partner so far. So, so thanks, thanks very much, Mike. So in terms of the pool plan arrangements that are out there now, um, I, I, I think I, I, mostly I just from on this slide, I want you to understand where does our 
solution fit within all of the acronyms. And so real quickly, we are the group plan solutions. So the third from the left, I guess, left side over, um, that's where the, the brighter way group plan solution fits. Um, it's, uh, you know, they, they've been called all kinds of different things. A, a retirement plan exchange is another term for it. There's other terms on the, on the slide there. But I just want to go through really quickly and distinguish kind of the group plan solution or the group of plan solution from MEPS and PEPS because you hear a lot about MEPS and PEPS um, just in emails and, and uh, kind of in, in all the information that you receive today and all the, all the different uh, promotions that are out there from different service providers. But MEPS, generally speaking, are sponsored by PEOs, uh, industry trade associations, or chambers of commerce. Those are pr the primary sponsors of MEPS. Um, when you sign up to, you know, or adopt a MEP as a plan sponsor, you're going into their document via a joinder agreement. So you're you're kind of abandoning your own plan document, your own plan design. Not that you don't have some um, flexibility with respect to your plan design through the joinder agreement, but it's very technically um, you, you're leaving your own plan document and joining somebody else's document. Um, these MEPs, all, all of these solutions are eligible for the new plan tax credit. So I'll just say that. So I, I don't have to say, hopefully I don't repeat myself. Um, when you go into a MEP, you're going to be filing, a, there's a single 5,500. So uh, once somebody adopts a MEP because they no longer have their own plan, they're not responsible for the 5,500. The sponsor of the MEP is responsible for the 5,500. And for that reason, most MEPs are audited because once you get more than 100 participants in a plan, whether it's a MEP or a single employer plan, you end up with a plan audit requirement. And so that can create some complexity um, and some additional issues for a plan sponsor to deal with. If, if they're a small plan sponsor and they've never gone through the audit process before, um, Certainly some of the fees associated with those MEPs and generally PEPs as well are going to be spent on the annual audit process. And even though there isn't going to be a specific billing for that plan audit fee, um, the anybody who adopts those plans is going to spend some of their time probably each year or every other year uh, responding to requests for information from auditors uh, just because that's the nature of the beast when you get into a larger plan environment. Um, typically, MEPs are going to all have a 338 associated with them. So um, that's one of the, the selling points of the MEP or the PEP or, frankly, our solution as well, uh, is that you um, have the, the plan sponsor has a 338 associated with it as a kind of a best practice way of shifting fiduciary risk on the investments from the plan sponsor uh, to the uh, plan provider. And then there's typically 316 services. So that's fiduciary administrative services. Again, an attempt at shifting fiduciary risk from the plan sponsor to the service provider. Um, oftentimes, these pooled plan solutions can be a threat to your practice. Um, and, and uh, specifically, I'm talking about MEPs, uh, since they often require that your client work with the investment advisor that's hired by the MEP sponsor. So typically with MEPs, um, the PEO or the Industry Trade Association or the Chamber of Commerce is going to do some due diligence and they're going to hire their own advisor. And that's who your client would end up working with. And there really isn't an opportunity for you to continue with that relationship. So. Um, I saw that as a threat to um, the clients that our advisors work with and, and our own clients. Um, and so I felt like it was important for us to have our own pooled plan solution that we could offer and that we could work with with all of the investment advisor partners that we work with. So PEPs, very similar to MEPs, except they're typically sponsored by a service provider such as a record keeper or a payroll provider. Um, and um, 
same same deal. You're going to have a single document uh, with a joinder agreement, um, single 5500, uh, probably an audit requirement associated with it, with some cost for that layered in. Um, in the case of a PEP, the pooled plan provider, the PPP, serves as the plan administrator, which is important, and it's a little bit different than the MEP. Um, the pooled plan provider serves as that for that that kind of plan administrator or the um, ERISA plan fiduciary um, and they take on that responsibility for the plan sponsor um, you know, almost almost in total fashion so the the only thing that the only responsibility that the plan sponsor remains with is the you know they need to push contributions and, and census to the, the record keeping platform and the plan custodian. Um, they need to pay attention to the fees. They're still responsible for making sure that their employees are paying reasonable fees. Um, and that's that's primarily the, those, those two um, fiduciary responsibilities are, are primarily what they're left with once they hire a, a PPP. To me, that can be, there can be a negative associated with that because the way most of these PEPs are promoted is uh, that there's really nothing more that the plan sponsor has to worry about. And um, I think that encourages plan sponsors to disengage and um, they're less likely to pay attention to the fees of the plan, less likely to pay attention to you know the the investments offered in the plan, and is it still the best possible solution for their uh, employee group? Uh, three thirty eight services are offered typically with those with PEPs, and three sixteen services also. Uh, so the so that brings us to groups of plans or the group plan solution, which is what the brighter way group plan solution is, and what distinguishes group of plan arrangements is that they're co-sponsored by a service provider like Ray and the plan adopter. Um, we, we do not serve as the ERISA plan administrator. That remains the plan uh, sponsor, uh, the, 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 the employer. Um, we do serve as a delegated 316 fiduciary, so we take on some of the fiduciary uh, responsibilities. So we take on the fiduciary responsibility for doing the due diligence on the selection of the record keeper, on the selection of the 338, and we offer our own TPA services in a 316 arrangement. But it's a little bit, there's less delegation of fiduciary risk or shifting of fiduciary risk going on, and the plan sponsor remains more engaged in the plan oversight process in general with our solution, which I believe is good. That's a good thing um, that they remain engaged. Um, in our solution, each adopter maintains their own document. So we don't have our own document that everybody opts into through a joint agreement. Everybody remains in their own document. So it really is their plan they all continue to file their own 5500 there's not a single 5500 so everybody files their own 5500 so if if you're a small plan sponsor fewer than 100 participants no plan audit you continue with no plan audit no expenses associated with the audit no complications of having to respond to auditor requests periodically um, which can be um, a nuisance to many small plan sponsors um, I think it something that isn't really discussed much in the marketplace, and I think what also helps to distinguish the group plan solution from PEPs and MEPs is deconversions and terminations, when those become a necessity, are easier. So it's easier to leave our solution than it is a MEP or a PEP. I think that's really important. As an advisor, you're an advocate for your client, you want them to be in the best possible solution each year. And if at some point our group plan solution is no longer the most efficient, lowest fee, not necessarily the lowest fees, but reasonable fees, um, the best 
service provider for your client, it needs to be, you, you need to be, it, it's helpful to you if you can move them in an efficient way. Um, and so a deconversion from our platform is very similar to a deconversion or moving from a single, you know, a, a, a single employer provider to another single employer provider record keeper. Um, our, our solution hat comes with a 338 also, and our solution has 316 um, administrative fiduciary risk shifting uh, services associated with it also. So those are all the same as the PEPs and the MEPs. Next slide, please. So real quick, the only thing I wanted to show on this slide, emphasize individual 5500 filings. Think about the group plan solution really as a bunch of um, unrelated plan sponsors coming together to kind of share the costs of a platform, whether it's the record keeping services, the TPA services, and the 338 services. Um, but it it is, but they aren't adopting somebody else's plan. So it, it remains their own plan, but they're just kind of doing some cost sharing. So it's very much kind of a, like a cooperative arrangement with other plan sponsors. And I think it's 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 ideal for non-audited plans. Next slide, please. Um, Mike, were you going to jump in on this one, or did you want me to handle this? I can't yeah, remember I can, what you decided on this can, one. <laughs> yeah, this, I think I like this visual. Uh, uh, you know, sometimes when you're whether you do a lot of work with plans or you're an advisor that dabbles here and there within the retirement plan space, you know, there's there's a lot of activities, there's a lot of decisions to make, whether it be an investment menu, a record keeping platform, all of the nuances associated with each of the record keepers and what they can bring to the table. Um, obviously there are TPA providers, there are bundle providers, lots of different things that are out there. So again, the visual to me here is that this has already been vetted, right? These service providers have been determined. They've gone through an RFP process. Ray and Associates will continue to evaluate um, the reasonableness of the fee structure for the for the GPS, but also ensuring that folks like Transamerica, folks like Goldpath Solutions, which is the 338, continue to do what they what they need to do. But if we move to the next slide. I don't think this is necessarily earth shattering stuff, but just wanted to make sure that everybody sort of understands the roles and responsibilities of each of each vendor. We'll speak a little bit more to what Goldpath on the 338 side brings to the table here in a couple of slides. Um, Ray and Associates, as you've heard, is the traditional third party administrator for the plan, but they're also, as Paula talked about, engaging in a 316 fashion. So. Each of the participating companies, as he talked about, will have their own document, will have their own unique design, and will also have their own unique 5500, which Ray and Associates not only completes, but also files directly with the Department of Labor. They're also um, introducing um, payroll monitoring services within this arrangement as well to ensure that um, each of the participating companies are transmitting their contributions on a timely basis. We found that to be very beneficial for organizations who might be doing payroll in-house and may not have some type of integration directly with Transamerica. So that's a, a real valuable service. Transamerica, as you can imagine, serves in the tradi tra traditional record keeping role, but we've also built in things like fulfillment services. So all of the legal and required notices that must be transmitted each and every year instead of the participating company being required to be the fulfillment center, we're doing that within this arrangement, even for brand new plans. Um, all of the eligibility tracking is done by us. All of the enrollment kit distribution is handled by Transamerica. Um, certain distribution requests are reviewed and approved by us. But at the end of the day, you as the financial advisor still are quarterbacking this whole thing. We can't stress that enough. We're just trying to design a solution that makes you, I think, a little bit more efficient from a practice management point of view. So then it allows you to 
take those investment reports and deliver them to the client. It allows you to spend a little bit more time with those customers from an education and an employee engagement perspective to help with outcomes, et cetera. So we feel like this is a pretty efficient solution for you as an advisor for segmentations of your practice, if it does make sense. Um, so maybe we can jump to the next slide. I think I was going to handle this slide, Mike. And really, all we all we really wanted to show with this slide, um, or to summarize, is kind of what the benefits of the group plan solution are for all of the stakeholders here. So the employer, you know, why would the you know what what benefits are there for the for the actual employer for the employee, and then for the for the financial advisor. Um, and we've hit on these two, so I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but. From the employer's perspective, administrative outsourcing, uh, the mitigation of fiduciary risk, um, and then the opportunity to perhaps lower plan costs. Um, one of the things that you get when you kind of come together with other plan sponsors and you go to market together, hopefully there's an opportunity for some cost savings, some um, group group buying power. Um, and it, it isn't necessarily going to be the case. Every plan sponsor comes to you, comes to us, comes to the group plan solution from a different perspective in terms of the size of their plan uh, based on the participant count and the assets. And there obviously are different providers in the market, all with different um, kind of um, mile markers in terms of or, or break points in terms of their um, fees um, but we try to design the, the fees of the plan and we'll get into this a little bit more um, in a minute but we try to design the fees to be um, always competitive regardless of the size of the plan adopter and we'll, we'll get into that here in a little bit uh, but but obviously the opportunity to, to lower plan costs is is an employer benefit. From the employee's perspective, 338 monitored investments. So hopefully the goal is that the invest that the fund lineup is always going to have um, funds in every asset class uh, in the top quartile of their peer peer group. Um, so always good good um, performing funds and obviously reasonably priced funds, uh, whether they're actively managed funds or index-based funds. Typically, you know, we want to have a mix of those because different uh, employees, employees all have different levels of sophistication in terms of, of their um, engagement in the retirement planning process or the investment planning process. Um, and then I think it's important that the, the employees have access to a local investment advisor at, to serve as their advocate. Um, and then um, access to really good educational and retirement planning tools. So uh, Transamerica has put together a very, I think a very user-friendly way for employees to kind of really on their own figure out, are, am I saving enough to have a comfortable retirement? And then for the financial advisor, we talked about it already, add scale by outsourcing. Um, fund selection and monitoring to an investment fiduciary. Uh, you just need to get comfortable with how that fiduciary is doing you know, that selection and monitoring process. Um, and if, if anybody's interested after uh, this webinar, if, if you wanna contact me or Mike, we're happy to share what a quarterly report looks like from a, from a uh, investment monitoring perspective. That's all provided for the advisor so that you don't have to spend any time getting ready for trustee meetings. Um, and then the opportunity for you to focus on uh, large account balances only. So um, for your larger plans, if you wanna, uh, for an additional fee, we have available through our 338 um, advisor on the plan, some financial wellness services that would uh, allow them to take care of in a very, um, but financially planning sound fashion, kind of the unsophisticated or the unengaged participant, and then refer all of the 
larger account balances, more sophisticated needs to the local financial advisor. So the opportunity for you to kind of focus in on those larger account balances. Next slide, please. So I'll jump in here as well. Um, I think if there's a I think if there's a slide on this entire presentation, remember it's it's this one just because I feel like as we all work with small businesses, these these certain tasks tend to tend to trip up some plan sponsors that are out there. If you look at Department of Labor statistics over the last three years, the sanctions that have been levied have only increased from one billion to 1.1 billion to then 1.3 billion in 2023. Um, in over 74% of the cases that they have audited, they have found issues and therefore have levied these sanctions. And then when you dive into kind of the specifics within the Department of Labor studies, over 90% of those issues are what you see on the screen here. Uh, administrative, operational, uh, payroll related in nature. And you know, when you think about the context of what our target market is, which again is that smaller privately held business, we're not going and thinking about this for a 3,000 life company. These are 30 life organizations, maybe 80, 80 employees, that kind of a thing. Typically the individual responsible for the retirement plan is likely wearing a multitude of hats on any given day. And the 401k may be one of those hats, but it may not necessarily be the priority. So it doesn't surprise me that when you think about it in the context of a small business owner, that some of these things may just fall through the cracks because it's just not their area of expertise. So the goal and the vision of this is to see if there's a way through technology and through service providers that we could take a lot of this work off of their plate. And so we've, we've accomplished that here by doing a lot of those day-to-day -day things on behalf of the sponsor, which is great for larger plans, but also probably even more important for plans who've never had a retirement plan before or companies who've never had a retirement plan before or organizations that have lots of employees, lots of turnover, et cetera, where this becomes exponentially more difficult. So the tasks in the blue are now off of, of your client's plate. The tasks in the white are still left with them, but one could argue that those are very manageable and reasonable based upon the things that we've talked about to this point. So a lot of this, you know, in order for us to do our things um, is predicated on good data. And if we switch to the next slide, and Paul, I think you're gonna talk here, um, it starts with the data that we receive from the company and or the payroll provider. So, Paul? Yeah, um, the, the most important point I want to make on, with this slide, uh, Mike, um, payroll integration is going to become, it is important now, it's going to become essential starting next year, especially for new plans, uh, because Secure 2.0 requires that all new plans starting in 2025, uh, if they have more than 10 employees. So you know, most, most plan sponsors with 401ks are going to have to have auto, automatic enrollment and automatic escalation on an annual basis. And our experience as a TPA, because auto enroll goes all the way back to 2006, but nobody really utilized it, especially in the small plan market, because it is so difficult for plan, small plan sponsors to administer. And they end up missing um, the automatic enrollment of their employees or the automatic escalation of deferral rates on an annual basis. And then you end up in a correction mode and it's just very inefficient and can be very expensive to correct um, if you've missed the auto enroll or the auto escalation point. Um, I think the nice thing about <clears throat> Transamerica is they have a payroll integration process that they call Paystart. And they have a, and the Paystart team has gone out and um, worked with over 150, and I'm sure the, the number keeps growing, payroll providers, national, regional, local payroll providers, um, to work on that file formatting so that all of the contributions, all of the participant data, census information can be pushed, each pay from the plan sponsor automatically 
electronically to uh, to Transamerica, which allows them then to automate the sending of all the enrollment packets, the eligibility information, all of the plan fee disclosure, investment disclosures, all of that becomes, we can now automate that if we know who these employees are and, and what their either their email address is or their home address. So that's what uh, payroll integration is what kind of um, allows automatic enrollment and automatic escalation to work. Um, it also reduces the opportunity for, for manual key punch errors, which um, that happens all the time also. Um, if you have a client that doesn't work with a payroll provider that's already integrated with Transamerica, Transamerica has gone out and tried to come up with a solution for that as well to their credit. So there's a third party um, intermediary called Payroll Integrations, which is a separate company and they will, for those companies that are not already integrated with Transamerica, payroll companies that are not already integrated with Transamerica, they will work with the plan sponsor, the plan sponsor's payroll provider and Transamerica to create those API files so that they can transmit um, those files after every pay so that you essentially create an integration process. Uh, lots of other benefits of payroll integration. It saves time on uploading contributions. Um, I know a lot of our clients complain, I'm sure you hear about it too, about the, how much how time consuming it is to upload those contributions. Oftentimes you end up with key punch errors, uh, contributions end up in the wrong source. There's all kinds of opportunities for error when clients are uploading their contributions. That all gets taken care of. Um, you say we save time as the TPA on the year-end census collection process. Um, and then just real quickly on the on the slide, we, we talk about 180 on the right side of the slide and 360, kind of the yellow arrow coming back. The most important, a lot of the most of the benefits are in the 180. So that's kind of the push of the payroll information from the payroll provider to Transamerica. But in many cases, Paystart has 360 integration with um, the payroll provider. And what that allows is for plan participants to log right into Transamerica, make deferral rate changes, make loan requests, um, and all of that gets pushed or, or address changes, whatever. And all of that gets pushed back to the payroll provider very seamlessly and it updates the payroll record. So um, fewer 360 relationships, they're all at least 180. Um, and as we go forward, more and more will become 360, I'm sure. Um, I think that's, was there anything else that, that we wanted to talk about there, Mike? Did I cover everything? That was perfect. All right, next slide, please. You wanna handle this slide, Mike? Yep. So, you know, what, one of the goals here is, is again, to try to do our best to make this as efficient for you as the advisor uh, as we possibly can. And we tried to um, come up with ways that utilizing a 338 service will not only kind of give you as the advisor the needed quarterly investment reports that allow you to talk through what's happening with this investment lineup, but even more importantly, to maybe add some additional value uh, that they could bring that maybe um, you may not have within your practice. So things like B benchmarking, which is you know a best practice from the Department of Labor perspective. They've um, incorporated employer fiduciary training and have created a, a series of different educational uh, events that if you have a client or a plan sponsor who would like to know more about what they should be doing on a, on a going forward basis from, from the context of a governance point of view, uh, they've got a, a program there as well that, that you could sort of tap into by simply gaining access to, to this group plan solution. But we also leaned on Goalpath to help with a more unique um, 
QDIA or target date solution for the GPS. Uh, what we have found out there is that while the target date offerings have grown in popularity, certainly from the standpoint of retirement plans, um, they offered a unique platform that not only involves a collective or CIT structure, which in general will offer lower expenses than retail funds, but they also, through this CIT structure, are afforded the opportunity of not just using one single manager to build out a target date suite. So while this is passive and indexed focused, there may be investment options within this target date suite that may be managed by multiple fund managers. So that's kind of unique and different. But what I think is probably the most powerful aspect of the target date offering here with the brighter way is there there is a risk overlay component to the target date. So traditionally you have vintages that are either five or 10 years that are built and you have to sort of assume that everybody is a similar kind of investor. But what Goldpath did was they built out three different glide paths based upon your risk tolerance. So if you're a 2030 investor and you're conservative, you will actually have a different portfolio than someone who might select an aggressive 2030 target date option. So it gives us just a little bit more customization to an asset class that is gaining significant market share and uh, significant new assets you know, from the retirement plan side. But we've also uh, partnered with them to help out with other um, more non-routine things like the fee benchmarking, like fiduciary training for sponsors as well. So we feel like at the end of the day, it's a good way to kind of bring value to you as the advisor, make it easy and also give you access to some, some neat, uh, more unique things. So we'll switch to the next slide and we won't spend a lot of time on this, but it really is just sort of a synopsis of the lineup. I think probably the best way, if you really wanted to get into the weeds is for Paul and I to provide you with the a sample of the quarterly monitoring report because it does a lot of really good work at kind of getting into the weeds on funds. There's a really nice market review, recap, et cetera, being done by, by Goldpath as well. Um, yeah, I would say. This, we to at least, yeah, we wanted to at least show you what, what the lineup looked like. Exactly, because because of, because of who the audience is in this case, and, I, and we know it's important to all of you, but um, you know, we would also offer, and, and we offer this to, to any advisor that we work with, um, that it would that wants to consider the brighter way pooled solution um, is is we're happy to arrange an introduction to the chief investment officer at Goldpath and have him kind of walk through the methodology in terms of the criteria that they're looking at because it's a it's a combination of uh, some FI 360 criteria but then some proprietary criteria that that they utilize um, in the selection and monitoring process. Um, but it's it's um, I, I, it's a very sophisticated solution, um, and and I think very unique in the marketplace. Next slide, please. So we just want to say a few words on the pricing, so you, so you can get a flavor of how it works. Not that you're going to memorize it, but uh, we're. we're you know, we'll be sending this information out to you afterwards, so don't worry about um, trying to write all this down. There's a lot of information on these slides. Um, kind of um, the theory and how we put the, the, the fees together was, first of all, again, trying to be a good partner with our investment advisor partners um, and, and trying to be good fiduciaries um, of the platform. We wanted to create a pricing structure that at any point along the way, regardless of who the adopter is and how large the plan is that's adopting the, the greater, uh, the, the brighter way group plan solution, it's always going to be competitive. Is it going to be the lowest? Maybe, maybe not, you know, compared to other group solutions out there, compared to other single employer solutions out there. Um, everybody has different breakpoints uh, in terms of record keepers and other providers. 
um, in the marketplace. But because of the way we built the fees, I think they were always going to be in the ballpark and, and they're always going to get lower uh, as a percentage of assets as your plan client, as your client's plans grow. Um, so um, on the left side, um, kind of some of the, uh, first of all, these are all in, so we're not gonna break out Transamerica, Ray and Associates, Goldbath. Uh, we have that information if you want it, but um, these are kind of all in to kind of keep things simple. On the left side, plan service fees. So uh, for, for very small plans or startups, uh, any plan with less than 250,000 in plan assets, um, or excuse me, more than 250,000 plan assets, you're looking at a 750 startup uh, fee and that handles their plan document, uh, conversion, et cetera. If it's a startup plan with let or anything less than 250,000 in plan assets, you're looking at $1,500. And, and that really is just based on our experience with the plan we've, we've been offering this for going on three years now. Um, we know we've got more time to educate and to implement um, or to set up a plan in a startup mode or a very small employer. So uh, just trying to cover some of our hard costs up front. Those are one-time fees. Annual, excuse me, annual administration fees are $1,000. That's about 50% of the going rate for most TPAs. <clears throat> and um, that's a build, that would be a build cost to the plan sponsor. That's only, that's waived once you get to a million dollars in assets or more than under participants. And we'll, uh, we'll show you why here in a second. Um, moving over to the right side, um, we've got some uh, participant per head fees and we've got some asset-based fees. And the reason we designed it that way is because we believe every participant should carry, you know, they should have some sort of minimum amount of fee that they are charged regardless of their account balance. Um, and then some of their fees should be assessed on a, on a, you know, allocated rateably on an account balance basis. And so we have asset-based fees too, but I think that's a, a more equitable sharing of the costs across all plan participants um, participating on the platform. Um, so from zero to a half a million, you're at $40 a head. Once you go over half a million up to three quarters of a million, you're at $35 a head. From three quarters of a million up to a million, you're at $30 a head. And then anything over a million, you're at $20 a head. And that's, that, that remains. Again, that's so that we have equity between small account balances and large account balances or more equity. And then um, I think if we go to the next page, I'm not gonna get into the individual transactional fees, but here I just on the next page, just wanted to show you how the fees go down dramatically as the assets in the, you know, in the adopters. And these are specific, this isn't all the plans aggregated. So this, these fees are, are for each adopting employer. So you can see, a startup plan is going to start at 125 basis points. And if a plan, let's just say a, an $8 million plan joins the group, they're going to come in at 16 basis points. So, you know, and that's the way it should be because, you know, um, a large plan that joins the group should not be subsidizing a small plan. And if a large plan leaves the group, it doesn't impact anybody else's pricing. It doesn't doesn't make it more expensive for the small plans uh, to remain. Um, and so that all of this was done very intentionally, um, and we believe is is the best practice from a fiduciary perspective. Um, do you have any comments? You want to add anything there, Mike? Yeah, only that you know the the numbers that you see here. Um, this is banded pricing. So as companies get larger, obviously fees go down, but they go down back to dollar one, right? So it's not 45 basis points on the first, yep. you know, 750,000 and then 40 on ongoing. Um, and know that all of these services that we've discussed to this point are embedded into this asset fee. So it includes TPA 316 record keeping and 338 fees. Um, 
And I think, you know, sometimes people just sort of look very simply at, all right, give give me an idea of where a million dollar plan looks. Um, and so if you just kind of refer back to the previous slide and then also take this into account, because the base fee is waived by Ray and Associates, the per head goes all the way down to $20 a participant. And then you're at 35 basis points for all of those uh, needed services. It, it does hunt, it really does. And all of, in a lot of the analysis that we've done from a side-by-side -side perspective, I'd say at least in 90% of the circumstances, we've been able to find some level of cost savings. And if it's been sort of a tie, the fiduciary relief and all the things that we bring to the table has kind of broken that tie as well. So we do feel like it can be a, a good solution um, in a lot of different areas. And if we go to the next slide, this, you know, I think just the, the concept of where this maybe has some application is probably worth a, a quick discussion as well. Um, you know, as Paul talked about earlier, um, these kinds of pooled arrangements are gaining some popularity out there. Um, so you, you may have clients and customers or prospective companies that are getting approached by trade groups or an organization that's now sponsoring a PEP for the first time. And so this, I feel like, gives you an opportunity to be able to defend um, what that particular proposal may bring to the table by having a pooled solution within your arsenal as well. So it could be a, a good retention tool. Um, we have found that some advisors have said, you know, we've got a pretty good model for what we do, but we'd like to continue to build our practice and go after bigger plans. And we've identified this solution because it's so comprehensive as being a good all-in program for our plans under 3 million, right? Something like that. There's, there's different ways to sort of look at this. Um, obviously, we don't, we don't have these issues within Ohio, but if you do have clients who are outside of Ohio in states that have mandates where those organizations must offer some type of retirement vehicle, California, Illinois, Massachusetts, et cetera, um, if you have clients who face those obligations, these are good, good alternatives um, comparative to what uh, the state might offer. And I think, you know, this concept of a, of a private label is, is probably something to consider too. Um, many of you likely have relationships perhaps with uh, centers of influence, um, maybe a small trade group, maybe a chamber here and there. You know, as, as you have these organizations that you may work with, the challenge of building something from scratch for them uh, <laughs> goes deep and wide for sure. Um, and the, the, the idea here is to say, look, instead of us trying to figure out how we can price something where we don't necessarily know the take rate of members, um, the idea here is to potentially sort of look at this as the kind of go-to solution for members of a trade group and simply white label it or private label it to uh, incorporate marketing materials, logos, things like that of that trade association so that it could effectively be a, an immediate solution which might have some application for, for those members and what they're trying to accomplish. We've seen advisory practices do it. We've seen smaller payroll companies do it as well. So we're seeing different kind of applications to where this group plan solution might make some sense. Um, so we certainly would welcome an opportunity to talk with you about something that you may be thinking about or working on to see if it, if it uh, does make some sense. But we wanted to kind of end up uh, here on the next slide with just sort of the final points of the GPS. So Paul, I'll let you kind of close it out. Sure. So hey, I'm not going to. I think we're going to wrap this up pretty quickly. But um, just advantages of the GPS. Just in summary, obviously simplicity. Uh, you're offloading administrative work, so full administrative services, including lo a local TPA support. Uh, which could be very different from a PEP offered by, you know, a large national payroll provider. Uh, you're talking about local TPA support on plan design, et cetera, uh, plan consulting services. Um, 
You're talking about the PASS services, which are the, uh, the, the fulfillment on the notices, the distributions, the loan paperwork, all of that is handled by Transamerica uh, for the fees that we showed you. Uh, you, and you're adding in payroll integration uh, with the Paystart team, um, and which is is constantly um, expanding its influence um, and, and adding um, partners with with new uh, payroll providers around the country. And then uh, fiduciary risk outsourcing. So you're incorporating 316 fiduciary support and 338 investment fiduciary support. And then um, obviously economies of scale pricing. Uh, I'm not gonna go into the details of the pricing again, but uh, tiered fees based on plan size. And then lastly, and it's not, on, it's not on here, but just for emphasis, provides a way for you all to scale your plan advisory practice uh, by reducing the amount of time necessary uh, to select and monitor the fund lineup uh, while relying on the investment fiduciary goal path solutions in this case. To utilize a formal fiduciary governance process. So I think that that kind of wraps up the information that we wanted to share today. If anybody has any questions or wants to stay on the line for a while, we're happy to engage um, for a few minutes. Um, otherwise, we will um, wrap it up there. And uh, certainly, if you have any questions if you if you'd like to follow up in writing with us via email or whatever um, you have our our contact information as well so um, any questions anything in the chat out there thank you paul and mike both for sharing those insights and thank you to our audience for attending um, at this time i'm not seeing any questions but if they do pop up please feel free to reach out. Um, we will be sending out that recording here in the next day or two as well. So be on the lookout and we appreciate your time today. Great, thank you.